Welcome into War Chant TV. This is Ira Schofel. I'm here with uh, a special guest, hopefully not a special guest for too much longer, maybe a more regular guest uh, and a contributor to WarChant.com and WarChant TV, Peter Schoenthal. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing well, and I, I think they say this in sports radio, but what is it, first time, long time, right? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's nice to be uh, uh, speaking with WarChant as someone who's been reading for a long time. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it. And um, so Peter is uh, an expert in the NIL space. There's there's a lot of experts in the NIL space. For a, for a space that's only existed for about a year and a half, a lot of people have uh, really tried to get involved in that business. But Peter's uh, a guy who's a Florida State guy uh, originally and uh, also uh, someone who's got a good reputation in the business. And I've appreciated, uh, as I've interacted with him, either on the message boards, on social media, somebody who I really think is trying to do it the right way. Uh, I'm not just saying this because Peter's here, but uh, you know, there's a lot of people in the NIL space that are out for a lot of different reasons. And uh, so I'm glad to have Peter helping us out and try to kind of understand the landscape a little bit. So what we're going to do in this uh, conversation is kind of kind of get the lay of the land of where things are right now in NIL in the 18 months or so that it's been uh, legal now in the NCAA world. But then also, you know, tackle some some Florida State specific areas, but then also uh, just kind of see where things are going uh, in the future. So if you've been confused about NIL like I have, and a lot of people are, this uh, should be a good conversation for you. But we'll, let's start off, Peter, with maybe kind of give people an idea of your background and uh, how you decided to get into the space. Because I, I know you, you went to law school and you've got a lot of uh, experience in different areas, and this is something that you wanted to, uh, why would you feel compelled to get into the NIL space? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't try to get involved in the NIL <laughs> space. It kind of you know, dragged me in. Uh, my dad wasn't really around when I was in high school, grew up in South Florida. And if not for my high school football coaches, I wouldn't have played. I'm sorry, I wouldn't have gone to college. I did not play college football. I'm a five foot eight white Jewish kid. Um, but they kind of helped me out. And I ended up at Florida State University, uh, was unsure of what I was going to do with my life. Ended up at the University of Miami uh, for, for law school. Don't worry, these colors don't run. I'm all garnet and gold. And when I was in law school, getting ready to go into practice, I decided to coach youth football. I'm the world's worst football coach. I had uh, kids end up at Florida State, Miami, Florida, um, LSU, you name it, never won a championship. But as my kids started getting recruited, I didn't want them de dealing with dirty street agents and things you hear about in the rumor mills. Uh, so if we could drive, we would go. So we would visit Florida State, Florida, Miami, UCF, schools of that nature. And because I was always doing uh, things the right way, um, I had a legal background. I got very close with compliance officers. Uh, for people that don't know, compliance kind of holds the key to the castles in college athletic departments, who can come on campus, who can't, uh, who can do what. And I just got very close with them. So fast forward about 21 months before name, image, and likeness started um, nationwide, which was July 1st of 2021, uh, Governor DeSantis actually announced that Florida was going to be one of the first states to start this. So we had about 20 months ramp up. And after that moment, every kid that I coached reached out and said, Coach Pete, can, can I make money? And I said, not yet. So I started thinking, wait a minute, who's going to protect these kids? Who's going to make sure that they're, they're paying their taxes? Because I don't want to represent them in federal court on tax evasion charges. Mm -hmm. And so I got reached out to during COVID from some uh, buddies of mine. And we started a tech company, which we basically work with compliance departments, universities, agents, collectives, athletes, and brands to make sure that they are compliant, that they're doing things the right way legally and, can, and, and handling the data. But what does make my company Athliance a bit unique is we are one of the only, if not the only company in the space that deals with schools, athletes, coaches, brands, collectives, and agents. So we kind of see everything and, and what's happening out in the space, what works and what doesn't, uh, which allows us to read the tea leaves. So you, uh, and again, I, I apologize. I should have mentioned the, the, the name of your company at the beginnings. You're CEO of Athliance. Correct. Um, and I think people can find that at athliance.com if they're looking uh, for more information about you or, or for what you guys do. Um, but, you know, it just seems like since this all started and you've been in it longer than a lot of us even knew it existed. Um, but it seems like over the last 18 months, it, it has, it's almost like, the equate, you know, I'd equate it to kind of being on a, a boat in rocky seas where you're kind of like all over the place, you know, early, especially from Florida State's perspective, uh, we didn't know what was out there. And then all of a sudden you're turning in this direction, turning in that direction. It seems like things have kind of found some steady ground lately. Am I wrong on that? Am I right on that? It feels like at least people seem to have an idea of, of 
maybe uh, of what the lay of the land do you am i right on that or, or does it still feel like we're still in uncharted territory you're right in that people are starting to understand what niches work what niches might not work um i and i posted this on the board i'm nilp i mentioned that based on what i was seeing i thought it was a good thing that florida state was kind of taking this slow approach mm -hmm. um we are in a society today where we want answers now 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 but you were better off observing the lay of the land because we've seen so many schools right uh who have gotten into hot water recently that came out the gate fast and that was going to always lead to problems now the one thing i will caution is it seems like things are calm because no one's gotten in trouble yet right so everyone's starting to push that envelope push that envelope uh there are reasons i believe that the ncaa hasn't come out and punished someone yet but just remember the NCAA in all other capacity, including NIL, has a seven-year statute of limitations. So if you're pushing the envelope too far and you're breaking those rules, that doesn't mean in a year or two, once the NCAA figures out whether or not they're getting federal intervention right on this, that they can't come knocking on your door and levy some penalties. That's interesting you bring that up. That was one of my questions I was going to bring up later, but I'll jump ahead to it and come back to this other stuff. But I was listening to the College Football Inquirer podcast, which is uh, Dan Wetzel, Pat Forty, and Ross Dellinger, three guys who are very um, connected in, in the college football world, but also this space. Is, and they were talking the other day on one of their podcasts about um, the NCAA enforcement side, and they basically hinted, uh, sounds like they're, they believe the NCAA is going to make some uh, come out with some decisions pretty soon. They've been doing a lot of background work, investigating in different cases. I think most people that are listening to this or watching this are, are going to roll their eyes because I think there's a perception that the NCAA has kind of thrown up their hands. Do you think that that's possible? Do you, do you get the sense that there might still be um, maybe some, some accountability uh, in these cases? Well, there will cer certainly be accountability. There, there's two different ways you can go with that, though. Um, let's talk about what Ross Dellinger um, shout out to Ross if he's watching. Um, what he was alluding to, because I've spoken to him about this. I was a criminal defense attorney before this, right? I, I told you I had a weird path into this. Big investigations don't happen overnight, right? We had to kind of see what was going to happen, how people were pushing the envelope, let them take their steps, and then do full investigations. And these investigations are not easy because the NCAA doesn't have subpoena power. Although there is one little funny way they can get it. We'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> Um, I do have a theory that while the NCAA is looking to get federal intervention because this space is deemed the Wild West, they are slow playing um, some enforcement mechanisms because it's hard to get Congress to act if you're enforcing and policing the space because then there isn't this we need to help and there isn't this urgency. And remember, one of the reasons why the NCAA can take that path is there's a seven year statute of limitations. But the rumblings we've been hearing, um, investigators have been on certain campuses. They are building their cases. And I think the NCAA wants to bring a case against the school, have a lawsuit initiated against it, maybe by that booster so they can get subpoena power, right, through a court case. And it's just so people understand what that means. Right now, the NCAA can't go to a booster or potentially even people at a school and say, give me your phone records and emails, right? Um, but if a court case is initiated, they can. One of the things that makes me think that Ross Dellinger is correct, that the NCAA is gearing up to levy some penalties, is we got new NCAA guidance about three months ago that basically let the schools know you're guilty until proven innocent. And the reason they did that is because nobody was cooperating in the investigations. Uh -huh. So one way to get cooperation is say, show us why it's not an infraction. Now, when you talked about that ruling a few months ago, when we talked off the air the other day, you mentioned that one of the things that it's, it also kind of gave the implication or not ruling, I guess their clarification, their announcement, a few guidance, a few months ago, um, that it, it kind of gave the implication that maybe they were going to be most concerned about people, schools using NIL to entice student athletes to come to their schools, maybe a little bit more so than what you're doing to retain your own players. Was that, uh, is that, is that right? Yeah. The, the fork in the road from basically, are there a lot of rules or a little rules are, is that individual who's getting a name, image, and likeness deal enrolled or not? If you're, you know, if, if we're talking about retention, and again, there's a lot of rules and logistics as to what is a real NIL deal. I actually hate the phrase NIL. It connotates something that is totally different 
than what the space was. This was just supposed to be so you can go do a subway commercial. Right. This is never, you know, Ira, I told you this off air. Imagine Lamar Jackson's a free a free agent, and he's looking at the the Detroit Lions, and a group of wealthy fans start to go fund me to raise ten million dollars to sweeten the pot to get Lamar to go to the Lions. That's what's happening in college football. And if I told you that was happening, you'd be like, that's the craziest thing ever. Um, but people cannot meet, right? Boosters, um, non-coaches cannot meet with student athletes who are not enrolled at a school, whether they're high school kids or in the transfer portal. We know everyone's doing it, um, but it's still illegal. And the NCAA is going to probably go after the most egregious. So schools are going to have to kind of re- figure out how far are we willing to push this? When your kids are on campus, there's really three rules, right? Is there quid pro quo? Is the athlete doing something for the money? And is it an inducement? Is it tied to their enrollment, which it can't be, and then pay for play? I can't give you a hundred bucks to go score a touchdown. Right. I, I feel bad because now I'm, I'm going in a different direction. I'm going back to what you're talking about a minute ago. This is going to be all over the place. But, but when you talked about the subpoena power and the legal piece of this, that's got to scare schools to death because I think back to, wasn't that like, like the Nevin Shapiro case, wasn't that kind of like once the law got involved, that's when it's, it's becomes much more difficult for a school to contain their issues. Absolutely. Let, let, let's run through a hypothetical. Uh, school A has a booster that's, you know, doing uh, bad things or crazy things. And the NCAA hits them with a penalty saying lack of institutional control. Like we've seen schools get hit with that forever including Reggie Bush at USC when they took the the national titles away from USC, Nevin Shapiro. I mean, schools get hit with that. Every infraction is essentially a lack of institutional control, right? And so part of that, the NCAA can say, you have to ban that booster, disassociation. So that booster can't give money. That booster can't come to games. That booster can't come on campus. Again, think Nevin Shapiro and think the SMU guys in the 80s. That's essentially what they did. So at that point, the booster has one of two choices. One, take it on the chin, right? Okay, I'm out. Or two, file a lawsuit and challenge it. One, I actually think that booster could very well lose that case. But two, if you initiate that lawsuit, all of a sudden discovery happens, which means the NCAA is now entitled to all the phone records and the emails associated with that booster in connection with the school. I, sh- you know, <laughs> how many coaches do you think are texting? I need this for this high school recruit. You know, I did the same speech at a coaching convention a, a year ago with a bunch of power five coaches. I've never seen so many people take notes while being this wide eyed. Like it, <laughs> that's how you get caught. And the schools realize that, but the coaches and the boosters don't. And that goes into, it's time for schools. And I think FSU is doing a great job of this to take control over their culture with NIL and make sure that there's internal alignment and external alignment, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. Yeah, and I actually was going to ask you about. You posted a thread on Twitter the other day, and people, why don't you give uh, everybody your Twitter handle and uh, as well at nilp. Easy to find me. And uh, when you um, you you discuss kind of what you think, I guess how schools should align their nil. And again, it's it's hard to really talk about this, and, and I'm I feel more comfortable about having these conversations now than I did six months or a year from a year ago when it felt like everything was kind of underneath the underneath the uh, the, the shroud of secrecy. Um, but what schools should be doing. And, and if you could kind of recap that for, for people that want to know. Yeah, well, you were right to not want to have those conversations four or five months ago, because one of the missing pieces of legislation actually came out about three, three and a half months ago from the NCAA, where they further clarified the role of the collective, AKA a third party entity. And essentially what the NCAA said was, from a school perspective, there's a separation of church and state. The schools cannot go out and negotiate the deals, broker the deals, get the deals. But third party entities are allowed and the schools can promote them. And the schools can say, you know, if you're a fan of our athletic department, you can go give to this collective, right? Who's supporting our NIL. Schools were unsure if they could do that. Uh, State bills made it difficult, but now we know that's allowed, right? And so now the schools for once, in my opinion, for the first time in NIL have the power. Because if you're a collective and you're breaking the rule, you're not being transparent, you're not you know, doing what the university wants, the university can come out and flatly say, don't give to that collective or give to our other collective. So there's multiple ways to win with NIL, right? Do you want to be more involved in the high school space legally, right? That's a whole nother issue. Are you more focused on merit-based and equality? Are you more focused on retention? 
Is it a hybrid? So the first things that are happening now, in my opinion, are coaches are finally being educated on that approach. And once they understand that, teams need to discover what their NIL culture is and their identity, right? Um, your culture within your locker room should match your culture with your NIL. And I think we're seeing that at Florida State now, right? Talk about the slow and steady approach. It looks like Florida State's very big on retention, which is the easier one to do legally, right? Um, once you establish that, you need to make sure, like every other thing in your culture, your coaches, your administration, and your players are all aligned and have a proper expectation. But the final part of that is, is you need to make sure that your boosters, whether it's a collective, whether this goes to booster clubs, right, are aligned with that vision as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Because everything ties together. Because what we're seeing is a problem with a lot of these schools that jumped out the gate and got boosters involved. Their boosters are acting like general managers of teams, owners of teams. They're recruiting kids that the coaching staff may have offered but aren't going all in on. They're setting numbers that are ridiculously high, which now coaches have to recruit against themselves with a set market. It causes chaos. And then that leads to locker room fighting, like the Texas A&M side, right? I know for a fact, every kid did not get a million dollars at Texas A&M. We, we, we let a guy by the name of Slice Bread put out a rumor <laughs> and we all, we all ran with it, right? We, so I understand where Jimbo got mad because you had freshmen showing up to campus thinking, where's my million dollars? And then you had juniors and seniors on the team saying, screw those kids. What are they making all that money for? I'm the one driving the bus. I'm the one putting in the time, sweat and tears and have been here helping you win. And now your culture is, is separated. We saw that at a few schools that were supposed to be a little better this year that were heavy in the NIL game that fell apart. So now that we're learning about this, you have to have a culture and then you have to have alignment. And very few people have alignment I don't want to say Florida State stumbled into it, but their slow and steady approach and not jumping out the gate allowed them to organically do that, and it's working. Another program that it's working for is Michigan, and look where Michigan is, right? Look where Michigan is in the transfer portal. So we're, everyone's starting to figure it out, but, but again, it's still chaotic, it's still hectic, and we're still learning. And we could talk about this later at another time, but but it almost uh, from listening to you talk about it, me just thinking of a coach's mindset. It maybe doesn't even matter whether or not you go with the approach of everybody's going to get fifty grand, and we're all just equal, we're all teammates. Or if you do have the hierarchy of the star players get more, as long as it's all kind of defined. I mean, do you think it's going to work out? No matter wh what path the coach decides to go, it could work out. They may not all have to. It may not be one size fits all, right? As long as everyone understands the expectations and there's transparency, everything is fine. When your locker room is being run by rumors, everything is not fine. <laughs> and, and, and that's the big part of this, right? I think merit-based is fine. I, I think it's important or, or more than fine if your better players have better deals. I mean, that's listen, better players get subway deals, right? Versus you know not getting a subway deal. I mean, that, that's just the nature of marketing in general. But what's great about that is if you're a freshman and you come in and let's say there is that baseline, like the $50,000 to, to own your marketing rights and done legally, right? There's an expectation of, okay, if, if I perform well and I get on the field, right? These are what the things I can expect rather than these fake contracts that are being thrown out and you have something to work for. And by the way, that lets your seniors and your juniors police the locker room, Right. You only get so many hours with these coaches. Um, I, I spoke with a coach who won a national championship at a power five school who's coaching at that school right now. And he says that's his biggest issue is there's no locker room hierarchy anymore. The freshmen and the sophomores don't want to listen to the juniors and the seniors. The juniors and the seniors don't like the freshmen and the sophomores because they think they're getting more money. And it's chaotic. You can't build a team like that. I mean, this Florida State team we just watched this past year was so enjoyable because they had good locker room chemistry. You can easily erode that if you don't have a proper plan, and we're starting to see that. So how does a school like Florida State have a plan when we all know the state of Florida right now? Now it may change, but as of now, uh, you know, they're, they're, the schools in the state of Florida are supposed to be, by law, separate completely from the NIL. They haven't been able to have the hands-on controls like, like you were saying. I mean, you see now when you look around the country since that ruling or since that guidance from the NCAA, you're seeing athletic directors hold – press conferences or, or meetings with their NIL staff or the NIL groups, the collectives that they're working with. So there's a lot of uh, symbiotic, symbiotic relationship there that 
it still has to be somewhat separate in the state of Florida. So uh, how do you think, how, how are schools navigating that in the state right now until the, the state of Florida changes their law? It's a great question. Um, I've been on record numerous times that before this NCAA guidance we got three months ago, the state bills were useless. Um, but now that the NCAA has allowed for schools to promote their third-party entities, i.e. booster collectives, finally the Florida bill is actually more restrictive because the schools can't do that. Um, so there is a bill on the floor right now in the state of Florida to rectify that. Uh, call your local representatives. Uh, it's moving fast. By July 1st here, that bill should be changed and that won't be an issue. Um, and I don't think that's going to have any short-term or long-term consequences for Florida, Florida State, Miami, so long as that bill gets voted on and passed um, this year in this legislative session. Gotcha. So and would it, if it if it gets passed, will it go into effect like immediately or do they have to wait for a year? Or how, how does that They'll probably set it for July 1st like they did this last NIL bill. Um, schools fiscal years are basically July 1st through June 31st. So they'll probably align it with that. Okay. And then you talked about the the numbers that are out there for some of these different deals that are not accurate. Um, I rolled my eyes when I heard the initial reports about Jaden Rashada's deal uh, or alleged deal at Florida. We've kind of seen that situation play out. I don't know if he, I'm not asking you to specifically talk about that case, um, but how, how can situations like, how seriously should we take numbers that are out there like that? And, and, and how, um, can schools avoid situations yeah. you know, like that one? So without saying too much, take the number pretty seriously. Okay. Um, that's all I'll say on that. <laughs> right. um, the way to avoid it is what we spoke about earlier, culture and alignment. Um, again, I, I've also mentioned earlier that I didn't give a lot of credence to the state bills. And one of the reasons was is, What's what is the state of Florida going to do? Punish Florida, Florida State, and Miami for doing the same thing that Georgia, Alabama, Texas are doing? Good luck getting reelected if you do that, right? <laughs> right? Like, what's really going to happen? But one of the biggest issues in this space is there's no regulation and enforcement against athlete representation. These agents, right? There's very little transparency. There's nowhere for parents to be able to go or schools to be able to go to find out if someone's registered with the NFLPA or registered with the state. My company, Athlions, is building that. I think a big part of the Rashada situation is just that. Bad representation, everyone leaking information, everyone trying to look good um, and, and come out in the situation the best, all right? And nobody looks good. Jaden doesn't look good. The collective doesn't look good. The school doesn't look good. The best way to fix that, though, is exactly what we talked about, culture and alignment. And also, be careful what you're offering high school kids. I mean, at the end of the day, and Ira, you and I spoke about this. When I was involved in recruiting, the I, I coached multiple five stars, some that didn't make it and some that did. The ones that made it had this. The ones that didn't, didn't have that. So if you have a kid that's only asking for money and, and looking for certain handouts, chances are they're not going to work out versus the ones that are focused on development and getting to the NFL, right? And NIL is no different, right? So I, I, one of the things I think Florida State's doing a good job is identifying the athletes that aren't just looking for the handouts. I'm sure we have some people on the board that think we need to do better in high school recruiting. I'm not here to argue that, um, but that's a big part of it. Uh, and again, Let's say that deal went through with Jaden Rashad. He got 13 million over four years, right? Now, you're, Florida's not getting a single quarterback that isn't, you know, that's not doing four years, 14 and above, because the message that sends is you don't think I'm as good as Jaden Rashad. So that's where you have to have these conversations because things can get out of control quickly. But the problem at Florida was very easily bad representation, lack of alignment, no established culture. That Collective is one of the first collectives out there. So they were super fast acting and it created the perfect storm, right? You mentioned the boat and, 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 and the water we're on, they hit the perfect storm. So where do you think we're at right now? We'll wrap up here soon. We've talked about a lot of different parts of this and, and, and my, my idea, and um, I think you're good with it is maybe we'll come back uh, pretty regularly and, and kind of tackle issues a little bit more in depth and not jump all over the place. But I felt like we needed to hit on a bunch of different topics uh, right off the bat. But um, do you feel like uh, most schools now are starting to figure it out what you're talking about and, and understanding that you have to have some, or, some uh, sort of alignment from the standpoint of maybe learning from their own mistakes and learning from the mistakes that you're seeing around the country? Yeah, they're trying to. Um, I think schools conceptually are like, okay, 
it's time to put a plan in place and have everyone work together. They're just struggling with it. Right. Um, like one of the best examples is that Iowa, right? You have a collective that, that pops up and they want to help the school and they reach out to the university to get the donor list to try to get some money. And the school thinks that they're going to have to fight for money with that collective. And they say no, right? So no one's on the same page. So conceptually, yes, but it's not easy. And people started to probably realize this in the last few weeks, if you really think about it. So I think we're probably a half year away from real alignment and culture and the schools that took the slow and steady approach and stayed true to themselves have a leg up. And again, I mentioned Florida state and I mentioned Michigan. I, you know, look at the portal. The portal kind of shows what programs are doing a good job in building because the players talk juniors and seniors aren't their last chance going to a place that's dysfunctional all over the place and not aligned because they're, your best salesmen are, from your program are the kids. Uh, so I still think we're a few months away from that. I just think a few schools are ahead in Florida State. Weirdly enough, because I've been reading the boards, we're one of them. I know the <laughs> boards don't always think it, but I promise you we're, we're doing the right things. And shout out to Mike Alford, one, one of the, the, the top ADs in this space doing good things. And then how do you – just follow up on that real quick. How can a school um, get a collective in line if a collective or just one – donor or one booster who's got a lot of money, like how much power will schools have? I guess you ultimately they can kind of freeze them out. Is that what you see happening? Freeze them out and, and take it a step further. Make a public statement that, you know, because most schools have like two or three co uh, collectives at this point, right. right? Come out and say, at this time, we don't believe that this collective is doing the right thing. Uh, collective A, we believe collective B is. If you are going to donate NIL dollars, give it to collective B. They finally have the power to say those things. Right. And it's finally time to start calling booster bluffs, as I call them. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Peter, man. I, I really appreciate it. It was informative to me. And again, I know we kind of were scattershot with this one. I, I really would like to kind of zero in on a couple of topics when we do it in the future. Um, and I think, you know, kind of give you some time to really kind of get into the weeds a little bit, maybe explain things a little bit fuller. Um, but I think this was helpful to me and I really appreciate you taking the time. No, Ira, thank you for having me. We'll get into the weeds. I've got I've got stories for days. Uh, <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier this thing's been around for 18 months. I had hair when this thing started, man. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to roll and, and awesome. share what I can share. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Talk, talk to you soon. Thanks, buddy.